Hi, Dr. Carl Stonecipher, and we're here in lovely Chicago for our next episode of my next ophthalmologist need no introduction. And it's George Waring and Carolini Rocha. Let's go see what they're up to. How are you guys? Oh. So welcome to Chicago. What'd you guys get in? We got in yesterday. Okay, so tell me a little bit. You're in Mount Pleasant now and you're kind of private practice, right? Yeah. Well, Waring Vision Institute, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Really excited. And I'm still with the residents. Okay, so still got plenty of research time. A lot of research and fellows, it, it's fun. Well, let's go upstairs and let's pick your brains on some things. Oh, we're, yes. we're, okay. we're so really excited to have you guys here. You know, this is the third part of a series we're doing uh, with Rainer. Uh, I consider you guys one of the power couples, Marguerite and Steve. You know, we've got Bill and Jen, and, and now you guys are, are going to talk about some of your research, you know, some of the things that go along. So I know you're a power couple, and George, she did get higher OCAP scores. So is she the smarter one? of Because I know she, like, you know, maybe has more publications than you and I. So do I ask her the tough questions and you the easy ones or what? Totally. Yeah. So, and I, but I have to say about you, I always consider, you know, obviously I knew your dad, he was part of my career, and I always consider you the guy that took the company over and ran with it and made it even better than what it was before. So, you know, I have a lot of respect for you as well. But I think for the most part, let's kind of dive in. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is... I think you've never used the Rainer before, have you? That's right. Yeah, and have you used the Rainer lens before? Yes. Okay, so you're doing some clinical studies with the Rainer. How are we gonna convince George that this is the lens and maybe who's the patient you're gonna put this lens in? I think we need to go back a little bit and tell about the story, right? Because okay. I remember we always had spherical lenses. Right. And then I remember 2005, 2007, we all moved to a spheric lenses to correct for the corneal uh, sphere cooperation. And then perfect, you have really perfect vision, but then we saw we were losing a little bit of that depth of focus. Right. So then finally, and I, I yes, I did some research in the past. 2009, I, I think, was exactly. when you published that first paper. Yes, yeah. and then um, uh, just after you, that you published, you know, the series in uh, laser vision correction, refractive surgery, showing that, you know, that, that perfect amount of uh, um, sphere corroboration that can uh, keep your distance vision without compromising the depth of focus. So, and I think that the, the lens is here now. Right. Finally, yes. right? So that you have that really perfect amount of sphere corroboration that uh, we call now this uh, new generation of monofocal lenses, uh, right? So with uh, this monofocal plus lens, that is it's, uh, fantastic. We're very excited. So George, that's a great point that she makes. You know, we're now talking about what do we call these lenses? Do we use trifocal, extended depth of focus lenses, they're monofocal plus lenses? You know, when we describe them to a patient, for me, it's like, okay, we're either gonna have a standard lens, which your insurance will pay for, or we've got these new lenses that do a little bit more, and then we've got, you know, these lenses that give you a limited range of near vision, but you're still gonna wear your readers probably, and then we've got the full range of vision. So, George, you've been around this block many times. What, what do you, when you're talking to a patient, how do you explain the different style of lenses? Carl, you surfaced two great points. We're talking about different categories of emerging technology, and that's in our mind really a important surgeon conversation. But then we have our client-centric conversations where we really try to make it meaningful to our patients. So what we've really moved to over the years is more of an outcomes-based discussion. So we really don't talk about technology that much, believe it or not. It's more about what are their goals and customizing a plan consistent with their goals. Now, given their candidacy, and these days we have so much great technology, more and more people are candidates. And this lens seems to be one of those perfect technologies to enhance uh, candidacy. We want to say, okay, well, look, we got a couple options, but you've got a couple issues and opportunities. So it's all positive. We try to, and that's something I learned from my mentor and good friend, Dan Dury. Mm -hmm. You just want to make it all positive. So it's all about opportunity. And we say, look, you got a couple issues and here are the opportunities. You're out of focus and you got a cloudy uh, lens that you're looking through. And we're going to fix both of them. And if you're a candidate, we're also going to restore your reading vision too. And guess what? Congratulations. You're a perfect candidate. And so you qualify. That's it. Very simple. So we don't even talk about the technology. 
We may be even using different lenses and different eyes, and we don't even really mention it at all. Um, it's all about creating a uh, customized plan to deliver an outcome. It's just outcomes based. Now, um, and I'm, you know, kind of want to get your thoughts on this too. F on the surgeon side of things, that's that's a whole different discussion now, you know, because we have more and more technology that behooves us to think about subcategorization as each one of these technologies, as we get more of these in the portfolio. So what are your thoughts on that? We all got to be on the same page. And, and your dad, JRS, whoever you want to say, started saying, okay, we got to have these graphs, okay? It's got to be standardized. And then when we go to these meetings, we, we've got to present the data in the exact same format. And then I think terminology is important. And what is a true accommodating lens? What is a true... EDLF lens. What is a trifocal and how do they work and are they combinations? Caroline, I want to talk to you specifically a little bit about the Rayner EMV. So the Abbey value is 56. So, you know, does that mean anything to you? Do, does does the quality of the lens come into play now? And I don't want to denigrate any technology, so we're not about that here. But does that, you know, for me, I just at ESCRS had a series that we we're getting 20 tenths at 10% at one hour. We're getting 2012s at like 20% at one hour. Obviously, bilateral vision, but it's a bilateral world. And I mean, I'll give you my single eye data too, but it's really, this lens is is a bilateral lens. So tell me what you think about the quality of the lens. Sure. So Abbey number and refractive index, of course, they're both so important, right? Because we know, you know, the lower the refractive index, the higher the Abbey number, and it's all related to chromatic aberration. So the normal eye has chromatic aberration. And when we implant a lens, we have different choices, right? But uh, if we choose a lens with a really high Abbey number, you can minimize that chromatic aberration. So the quality is very high. And uh, But let's talk about this new category, right? right? What is the monofocal plus or the new generation monofocal lenses in general? Um, uh, first, patients. Who are the best candidates? And of course, any patients that are having a monofocal lens, normal eyes, but also eyes that are not perfect eyes for diffractive technology, right? So patients with severe dry eyes or macular issues. And now we have a premium option with this monofocal category. Right. So clinically, what we're seeing, exactly what he said, you know, the distance vision is fantastic, is not compromised. And with the EMV, lens has a positive spheric aberration, and then you can achieve that slightly extended range of vision. Right. If you're targeting both eyes for Plano or maybe the first minus. So we can offer now what we call that premium monovision. So what is a premium monovision? So you can target your dominant eye for Plano or first minus and your non-dominant eye. We don't need to offset that minus 1.5 or minus 1 to 5 is that mini monovision. So then the eyes, they blend which is fantastic, right? Patients don't lose the depth of perception. It's a combination. So the reading eye still sees good for distance and the distance eye sees a little better for intermediate vision. So that's what we're seeing clinically, which is fantastic. What's been your experience, Carl, with that? To, to make it go back and simple, where I'm at is we're not bilateral, you know, same day surgery, surgeons for the most part in our cataract surgery, I mean, there are some places like California, the great state of North Carolina, South Carolina, we separate the eyes by about a week. So when you come back for that second eye, I look at you and I say, what are you missing? So can you see your phone? Can you see your computer? Can you put makeup on? I mean, it's kind of an intermediate world. And I see so many patients now that say, you know, I don't mind wearing glasses, doc. But a lot of these people, depending on what you just defocus this rain or lens, they're doing just fine without glasses. And then the other interesting point, if you look at a lot of our friends who remain nameless, that'd be a little bit of a HIPAA violation. Um, a lot of them are choosing monovision. They're not choosing the trifocal lenses. They're not choosing uh, what we're calling extended depth of focus lenses. So I think in terms of, of that, you know, where are you seeing your dysfunctional lens syndrome patients showing up now? Are they coming in at 40 and 45? Because that's what I'm seeing in my LASIK patients. More mainstream stuff. Yes, 50-year-old. Um, any hyperopia, we're typically, and not everybody is the same, but we're really looking at lens replacement, and that's a stage one dysfunctional lens as we described. 
Um, and um, But even in the late 40s, if there's any hyperopia at all, we're typically moving towards a lens-based procedure. And of course, stage two, if there's opacity, then we're fixing that in addition to the focus issues. So then it's lens replacement um, very most commonly. And then of course, stage three, which is a manifest cataract, then of course that you 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 have to really do a lens based procedure. So he and Dr. Chang kind of wrote the cord mu kind of you know where we are now. This lens we don't have to worry about that in terms of the big picture. I mean obviously some of these other lenses maybe we look at things, but some people are discussing that cord mu doesn't maybe matter as much as we think. What what do you think? I know he wrote the paper, but I'm asking you a question. I know. I think for diffractive optics, I'm still caution. I look. I look at that. You know, again, that at point four, greater than point three, but mostly for diffractive optics. And are you lining for Kinji one and four at the end of the procedure on on these type of lenses? Yes, yes. But again, for a monofocal plus for this new category, I really don't think there's an issue. Okay. And and what about you? Any other thoughts on cord mu these days? Well, I think we're learning a lot more about it. I mean, this we wrote that paper um, almost eight years ago. Um, and the interesting thing about that exercise was that it was really difficult to prove it clinically that it made a difference. But um, uh, through all of our work over the last decade on small aperture optics, we knew 100% it mattered. And I mean, we would... Um, we can recenter a small aperture optic in an eye, and you could immediately see improvement in distance and reading vision by five lines. So we know that there's uh, these things can matter, but of course, all the optics change and its impact on centration changes. But fundamentally, we know that centration matters. And but we do have new emerging data, um, but it may be a little bit more subtle than we thought. You know, things like coma, and that kind of makes sense. I mean, if you think about internal coma with a decentered diffractive optic or a zonal optic of any sort, then yeah, you, it, it it absolutely can make sense. But then the same stands to reason if we have a um, maybe an aspherically neutral uh, lens, then it's also been shown to have less impact on centration or vice versa. You're working now with the Rainer EMV. You're doing, you know, new technology, new techniques, new emerging technology and techniques. What are you excited about for the future of ophthalmology? I think, you know, of course, I have a really a passion about IOLs and optics and IOL designs. And it's really nice to see how we go more and more. We have a lot of options and it's always I, I like to say, you know, the science, you need to understand the technology and match the technology to the patient needs, right? Exactly what we're talking, uh, you know, listen to the patients, the hobbies. And, I, and I'm excited about this new category because, you know, I think you can, all the general ophthalmologists can use this lens. No concerns about dysphotopsias, right? That dysphotopsia profile, it, it's, it's uh, very sim it's similar to a monofocal IOL. Well, it's amazing, just getting back from Europe, that we're still so low on this category, but patients still have the need. And so that's where that's another tool in the toolbox for me for the Rainer EMV. It's given me more patients that are happier with their outcomes and they're, you know, maybe not spending as much money. I still am a big fifth to second guy. I know a lot of people aren't. That's a very controversial thing. But before we go, you think you're going to try the Rainer EMV when you get back or where you at? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, this is a technology we've been looking at very carefully. Um, and uh, in our surgery center, it takes a consensus, uh, like any surgery center, to be able to bring in a new technology. But we're very interested. We um, uh, have um, love the optics. But I think the thing I'm most excited about, perhaps, is we've never had a, a great solution for, um, for prolate corneas or hyperprolate corneas. And um, we've used an, an aspheric neutral uh, platform in the past, but I think this, um, further to our discussions, could have some therapeutic advantages uh, for these hyperprolate corneas that I think is really, really exciting. And then, of course, all the other opportunities that you all outlined beautifully. You got any last comments? You're the smartest person in the room, so... I think, you know, again, we need to go back and try. I'm very excited about this new category of yeah. lenses. Again, you can offer a premium option for patients that didn't have any options before. Economically speaking, or, or whatever. Exactly. In terms of their anatomy. Well, I want to thank you guys for taking your time out while we're here in this lovely city of Chicago. I hope you guys enjoy it, and we'll see you around at the meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Now I got to decide. 
Do I go to Cubby's White Sox? Where are you going? You go to a Cubs game. Deep dish pizza. And who Malinati pizza. pizza. Regular pizza. Or do I go for a river rider? Hey, can you tell me where the MoMA is? I hear they got a great exhibit. I think I'm gonna do that.